Winning a contract in a hot seller's market can be very difficult. And I'm here to tell you that it's not only possible, but I'm gonna give you 10 strategies, which if you combine them, will give you an amazing chance to beat out other offers. And I'm not just talking about paying too much for the house either. Stay tuned. Rick Elmendorf, Loan with Rick at Movement Mortgage. And what a video we've got for you today. I mean, I've get this question all the time from real estate agents and borrowers. I mean, how do you win in a market where almost every home is a multiple offer situation? So I came up with 10 strategies. If you use these and combine them, it's gonna give you a tremendous advantage over other offers. So let's go ahead and get started. Number one, make sure you have a good real estate agent representing you. Now I'm gonna be blunt because I've, it happens a lot. I mean, the family friend who's a part-time agent or the nice aunt that just got their license really isn't going to cut it in a hot seller's market. And, and I hate to break it to you, but in pretty much any seller's market, I'd like to welcome you to the good old boy network where deals are done and homes are sold in brokerage and before hitting the market and with significant bias between agents that enjoy working together. That's just the reality of it. So in this vein, I would take experience of an agent and an agent that has a good name in the community over all else. Number two, make sure the lender can sell your offer. Now, I'm not talking about the loan officer jumping in and playing real estate agent and trying to negotiate it. No, I'm talking about rate having little to no bearing in who you choose in this market from a loan officer standpoint. I mean, most every lender with regards to rate is pretty close to each other. We all get our money from the same place. But your loan officer must be able to call the listing agent, be likable, be trusting, and appear capable to the listing agent. This is huge in getting your offer accepted over other offers. And I can't stress how much that your loan officer can help or destroy your chances in getting your offer accepted. So you have to ask yourself, would you want your loan officer talking to the real estate agent on your behalf? Because they will. And most think it's the real estate agent doing all the talking on your offer, but I can promise you that the loan officer gets grilled pretty good because we're the ones responsible for fulfilling most of all of the contingencies of the contract. So having a loan officer that can basically sell you <laughs> is important. Number three, get approved. In conjunction with the last point, you can't just get pre-qualified or, or just pre-approved. You need to be approved. Most pre-approvals are nothing more than a pre-qualification from a loan officer and agents, they know it, they see right through it. You need to be fully vetted by your lender and know that you are 100% able to qualify for the loan. It's a big difference when your lender can actually say during the call, no, I have verified everything from the income, the assets, it's been through underwriting and we are approved. All I need is appraisal and title. So please, it's okay to start the full approval process early. Supply all your documents to your lender, get everything in. The worst thing is calling your lender the day that you're making the offer and saying, hey, I'd love to get a pre-approval letter. That's just not, you might get it, but it's not a real approval letter. So unless your loan officer is a real magician, not being fully approved is gonna cause you problems. Number four, bid over ask intelligently. Now, blindly bidding well above the asking price isn't gonna help you much in a multiple offer situation. And I said this in the beginning, most of these tips have combined together. You don't need to be the top offer on the table. It is, however, important that in a seller's market of a home that's really popular, to bid over the ask, but we have to do it intelligently. You have to know at what price to stop. So a good tactic is to write an escalation addendum to outbid the highest offer up to your maximum bid over ask. Um, and you can determine what this number should be by taking into consideration the home's current estimated value, not the asking price, and seeing what the estimated appreciation would be based on a historical and forecasted appreciation model. What I like to do is to calculate the appreciation over the next five years and see how many months it'll take me to break even. So basically the math is simple. At what point is the appreciation equal to the amount that I paid over the home's current value? That gives me my break even point. Now I like to keep my break even point within 24 months. Uh, anything longer that is maybe a little bit of a stretch in my opinion. So you'd have to really love the house and be like that location you're gonna stay with for a while. But even if you aren't 
close to 24 months, maybe you could extend your escalation a little bit higher if ancillary things exist in your offer. And But even if you aren't close to that 24 months, you know, perhaps you can extend your escalation if some of these other things that you need, love about the house exist. And by the way, if it doesn't work, then just back off and don't feel bad about it. Let somebody else overpay for the house. The only other thing I'll say about this is if this is your forever home and you just love it, just make it happen. Don't worry about your overpayment or the rate on your mortgage. Just win the house you love. It's that important. Number five is close fast and give them a post occupancy if needed. Now, sometimes a seller has to get up and go and sometimes they need to hang around because their new home isn't ready yet or maybe they're still trying to find something and they actually were one of those people that sold before they bought. But regardless, everybody wants their money fast. So be prepared to close in two to three weeks and allow the sellers up to a 60 day rent back or post occupancy. If the seller needs to stay in the home another 120 days, then you just adjust your closing date to give you know 60 days for your closing and then that 60 day post occupancy. Pretty easy. Number six is a home inspection for void only or just waving it all together. Now, I think this has become pretty standard. Um, I know different states call it different things, but uh, due diligence or whatnot, but pretty, pretty much is that if you don't feel like you need a home inspection, don't get one. And however you feel like you should have one or if it's an older home, then make sure you write it to void only and put a short time frame on it. Number seven is waive financing. Now, if you have your loan approved, it's super helpful to waive your financing contingency. Bottom line, if you are approved, you will make it to closing. And if there's no other major hiccups or conditions that could derail you from getting a loan commitment, the commitment is when the lender's underwriter signs off on everything, then waiving the financing contingency is, is, is a smart thing to do. It makes you a super strong borrower. Many borrowers make the mistake of not waiving this contingency when in fact they can. And in a multiple offer situation, they're going to lose out just because they have the fear that they wouldn't have any other way to get out of the contract. I mean, don't write the offer if you still potentially want to get out of the contract. Don't write an offer in a seller's market if you're going to have potentially cold feet. And by the way, for that exact reason, the seller will pick somebody who doesn't want a way out of the contract. It's really that simple. So it's not just about price. It's about people being willed and committed and that will get to closing. Sometimes it's important to look at it from the seller side. Number eight, waive the appraisal. Now I just did a video on this about how to waive the appraisal, the four types of appraisal waivers. I'll put a link here in the top to, so you guys can take a look at that. It's a very, very good video about these four different ways of waiving the appraisal. I'm a fan of, of two of the four ways to waive the appraisal, but when you're waiving the appraisal, you're not actually saying that an appraisal won't be done. It just means that you are agreeing to accept the value of the appraisal and well, it won't deter you from paying the agreed upon price in the contract. Now, some offers only partially waive this contingency, and this is most common. It's what I talked about in the video as being my suggested way of going about these things. And what this does is you put a cap on how much the home could under appraise by. And this effectively requires a backup plan, which you should have, and more on that later. Now, the only reason for an appraisal in the first place is to determine how much the lender will own you. Many borrowers think that an appraisal has something to do with the value of the house. It does not. It's only the, the value of the home is what you pay for it. The appraisal has no bearing on value. In my experience, removing the appraisal contingency is the main differentiator to winning a house that has multiple offers. Now, here's a little tip though. When should you not waive an appraisal? Now, the only time I would not waive an appraisal is when there's no backup plan for financing. And what I mean by that, you must have a, let's call it a low value backup plan with your financing and that you're, you and your lender establish what financing would look like before you make the offer. So there is no questions that, as to how to move forward after and should there be a low value. And the number one question I get when I'm calling a listening agent is, does my borrower have the cash to make up the difference or the delta if the home under appraises? 
So what they may not consider is that my borrower doesn't actually need more cash if the appraisal comes in low, but rather just more financing. So, and yes, because I've established a backup plan with my buyer, I can always answer yes. The borrower has the ability to make up the difference and that one seals the deal. Number nine, write the biggest, fattest, earnest money check that you can muster. This will make you look like a pro and someone that really wants the house. It'll turn some heads. If you pony up 5% or 10% deposit check and the other borrower puts up a standard 1%, you're going to probably win the deal if your offer is in the ballpark. And don't underestimate the value of this. A couple of quotes come to mind. Put your money where your mouth is and money talks and you know what walks. <laughs> Number 10 write a letter to the seller. Now there's a catch to this. Now, in my opinion, there's, this is the icing on the cake, the cherry on the top, the straw that breaks the camel's back. I'm telling you that in over 25 years of doing loans for home buyers, there's been nothing more impactful than a personal letter from the buyer to the seller. Make it part of the offer so someone can't toss it. But before I go into the details, there are fears amongst the real estate community that really has discouraged writing these love letters to the sellers with your offer. So the Fair Housing Act made it illegal for sellers and realtors to discriminate against buyers on the basis of race, color, religion, sex, national origin, disability, or family status, namely the presence of minor, minor children and many other things as well. So the problem is that most all love letters to the seller contain the exact items that sellers are not able to discriminate against. So most agents don't allow it to be part of the offer. But with this said, I still recommend a letter, but without the following information about your family, references to your children, details about your job, descriptions of how your family plans to enjoy the home. You know, just leave that out. References to a place of worship, anything else that reveals a characteristic protected under the anti-discrimination laws uh, where the property is located. So basically, here's my advice. Write a thank you letter allowing us the opportunity to tour your beautiful home. I encourage you to write this sort of letter with your offer. And I've been reading that the thank you letter being sent to sellers before making an offer even, including flowers is really a hit that's, that hits the heartstrings. Now, as far as what to write, just be natural and speak from your heart. Use only the names that will appear on the contract and don't sign it along with your kids' names. Sellers do love that you love their home and they especially wanna know that you will take care of it. Moving is very emotional and a heartfelt letter to the seller can make it feel like they are passing the torch to a worthy party. So a personal yet professional letter makes your offer more of what it should be, a relationship versus a decision based solely on the numbers. So there you have it, 10 ways to pump up your offer and win on a house with multiple offers in a seller's market. Now, I know it's very difficult for buyers in a seller's market right now, so if you have any thoughts or questions, please be sure to leave a comment. What's working for you out there? I'd love to hear it in the comments. Are you having any success with any of these strategies that I've said? Are you shying away from these, any of these strategies? Do you have any questions about the appraisal contingencies, which is a bigger, the appraisal waiver contingency? Go check out my video, by the way. It's going to be in the comments here as well. And anyway, if you like this video, please be sure and subscribe, like, and hit the bell for more content. And I will see you on the next video. <laughs>